Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, how the heck are you? I have no idea when this is going to be airing. I think mid-June. How's the weather? (laughs) This episode today, I do want to give you a little bit of a trigger warning. It's really about expectations and disappointments. And I share about not thinking that I had expectations around Mother's Day, and I did, and what happened. I understand that Mother's Day can be very, very triggering for people that have just experienced loss. I think I'm just going to keep it vague and generic. I think that this episode is about so much more about how, for me, as someone who's assigned female at birth, is so attuned to everybody else and what everybody else needs and what are people's preferences and their favorite restaurants and what do they want for gifts and how can I show up for them? And often we do not have that level of attunement in our lives. And like I talk about in this episode, twice in a matter of two days, I had expectations that I didn't realize that I had, and then felt incredibly disappointed. And that part of me felt that I didn't have a right to say anything, because I know that the people that I felt disappointed with, love me, care about me, would show up if they wanted. I was in this place where sometimes I'm very clear about what I want and need, and I'm able to articulate that and ask for it. And in this season of my life right now, it's very, very difficult. And I almost need someone to just almost co-regulate with me, help me make decisions, show up for me in the way that I would attune to somebody else. You know, when someone's not feeling well and you say, what what do you want? They, They go, I don't know. So you bring them soup and you bring them Gatorade and you bring them some saltines and you give them a book or a magazine or a movie that sometimes we need people to show up for us when we're not able to articulate what we need. And conflict can be very difficult for some of us as well. So I really talked through some very specific examples of what happened, how I felt that lack of attunement, how these same people were showing up for me in the same moment. And I felt like I didn't have a right to say anything because they were showing their love for me in other ways, but I was still having a lot of feelings about it. And my need to over control my feelings and reactions because of this fear of being too much if I just kind of have a meltdown. I think this is a very, very, very relatable episode with a lot of specific information and tools and tips about how do you, or strategies of how do you navigate through this. I think it's very relatable and you know what the topic is. And if that's not something that works for you, then I support you in taking care of yourself. I think that's it. And now, on to the show. Hey, Jen. Hi, Patricia. How are you? I'm okay, I think. I wonder if anybody else out there is having an extraordinarily difficult May. (laughs) There's a lot going on for lots of people right now. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Me too. Yeah. I hear you. Are we almost halfway through? Yeah, we're more a little more than halfway through it. So that's the good news. I'm okay. In this moment, I'm really happy to be together here with you. Mm-hmm. Thank you for your graciousness and letting me eat a little bit before we were meeting <laughs> as we were chatting because my belly definitely feels better. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing okay. I had a pretty rough couple of days, which we're going to talk about because I think it's relatable. But things turned around and I think it's re- it's really nice to be able to share the upside of a struggle. Cause I was reflecting, I normally don't track time the way that I do, but I was thinking about there was the week that you were coming out to visit the following week after you were here, like those were really positive times. And the next week I started to struggle the next week I was struggling. And in anticipation of recording this week, I was like, ugh, three weeks of talking about struggling makes me feel vulnerable. And it's been fascinating that when I go through periods of doubting about, should I be talking about this on the podcast? Should I, be showing up in a way that's really not authentic to me. That's when people in the closed Facebook group, unapologetically sensitive, or people shoot me an email or shoot you an email talking about how meaningful and significant the podcast is to them or making a disclosure about something and wondering like, oh, should I should have said that? And then 
you know, somebody saying, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you said that. That was exactly what I needed to hear. So I feel like I get these really beautiful synchronous, I don't know what they are. I, I kind of call them breadcrumbs. There's probably a better way, glitter, glitter bombs <laughs> from the universe. <laughs> I like winks from the universe sometimes, like just this yeah. little acknowledgement. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that it's, I love it when that happens. And I, I think it's important to say like it, it it's really deeply meaningful like mm -hmm. it, to, to hear that encouragement. You know, I mean, oh, you and I, we, en we enjoy meeting here and doing this and putting this together for anyone. And then it's like, you fling it out there. <laughs> it's like, you don't know who's listening or, right. if, you know, what, how it lands. I'm always, open to feedback, positive, or if it's negative, hopefully constructively negative. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's just, yeah, whatever, you know, assuming that if people are listening, it's because they're getting something out of it. Right. And it means a lot. So I'm also really thankful for the people that's, that have reached out Yeah. in the last week, just letting us know that it's, it means something, that it's impactful that it's relatable yeah. and maybe even like if there's, you know, something else that uh, someone would want to hear about. I know sometimes you put that in the Facebook group, right? Like if there's any mm -hmm. topic that we can discuss or something you'd like us to hear more about like, that you'd like to hear more about, like us to talk about. That's helpful. Yeah. Let us know. Unapologetically sensitive at gmail.com. If you want me to use your name, put your name in. Let me know if you want to be anonymous. The more specific information you give, if there's something that you want us to respond to or talk about that gives us context is really helpful. Yeah, I would look forward to hearing from, from anybody. Yeah. To have it be bi-directional, to have it be something that's co-created, because it is, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we say, and then there's how someone's taking it. It's very yeah. cool to hear that back. Yeah. Okay, I want to jump into what we're going to talk about. A, fr a friend of mine suggested that I listen to a podcast and it was over an hour. And after the first seven minutes, the person didn't get to what they said they were going to talk about. And they were talking in absolutes. And I'm like, mm. <laughs> 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 so I just looked at how many minutes we've been talking and thinking, Ugh, let's get going. <laughs> mm, let's do it. <laughs> so this is really more about expectations and disappointments. For me, it was about not knowing that I had expectations. I totally support knowing what you want to need and asking for it. And for many of us, there are times when it's much harder to do that. There's this mental load that goes into things of even if you say, what is it that you want? That means having to think about what I want, coordinate, giving information, all this stuff. And sometimes I'm just not able to do that. So there are a number of layers to this. My hope is that because this just happened to happen around Mother's Day, that that's not a trigger because I know that holidays, Mother's Day, Father's Day can be big triggers for people. And I want to be sensitive to that. But because I love giving you specific information, I'm just going to jump into the story. This year for Mother's Day, I honestly thought I had no expectations. Every year, my husband's amazing. He buys me flowers. He gets me one or two of my favorite candies. I just can count on that. And I usually expect a text from my kids and one of my sons was actually going to be in town for Mother's Day. And I encouraged my husband and my son to go play golf on Mother's Day because that was the only day that they had and that's the way that they connect. I honest to goodness thought that I was fine with this. And my focus is generally more on how can I support my mom and be there for her than really what my needs are. And in some ways I do feel like I kind of put my needs to the side because of that. And I'm okay with that. I thought I was totally fine. <laughs> I wasn't. Guess what? Mm -hmm. I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't know how to manage that because what went on in my head was, I know Steve loves me. He gets me flowers. Josh is here the morning of Mother's Day. Josh came in and said, Happy Mother's Day. We do have these books that we keep and everybody has their own books. And traditionally, we write in everybody's book for Mother's Day, Father's Day, birthdays. It's really a nice way instead of having a stack of cards that you hold on to, it's really a lovely thing that we do. I think since the kids moved out, we haven't been doing it as much because they're not always here. But 
I found myself feeling like, you know, when I was struggling recently, Josh drove down a couple hours to be with me and support me for a few days. And I don't want to be that person that is always asking for something. My gremlins were saying, no matter what you get, it's never enough. I didn't want to ruin the mood. I mean, it really was a struggle for me. And I didn't know what to do. I did end up talking to Steve about this on Mother's Day briefly. And then I just kind of, I spent some time with my mom in the morning. And then I pretty much spent the rest of the day in my room because it just was kind of spent. And it's a little bit hard for me to not compare that Steve's birthday is this week and Josh got him a gift. Josh got his brother a gift. Josh forgot my birthday last Mother's Day. I didn't get really upset by it. I just know that he doesn't remember. And it's hard for me sometimes when I'm in this place to feel like, well, (laughs) how come there's time and money for everybody else? And it's not that I want gifts, but it's that recognition and acknowledgement. It was hard. And I told Steve my intention was not to make him feel badly, but it was still hard. And Josh has a favorite place that he likes to get a meal for. We weren't able to do it the last few times that he was here for another reason. It's a place that my mom loves. This is what my mom wanted for Mother's Day. I don't dislike this place, but I have my own favorite place that I like. And again, you know, just wanted to go along with the group. So I just kind of limped through the day and I didn't isolate myself, but I really was tired. I napped a little bit. I was on my phone. Steve and Josh came in and talked to me. So it's not that I was being unpleasant, but I just, my energy was just very drained. And then I think it was the next day that Josh wanted to get a Padres hat. And so we went to Ocean Beach where you and I went, Jen, to look for some souvenirs because I thought they had Padres hats there. And there's this jacket that you bought that <laughs> that I loved and wanted to buy for myself, but th- the size just wasn't right. Like it fit, but it would be much better in a, in a size up. You bought the same jacket, a size smaller for your daughter it's a jacket that I love. So I thought, well, if we go there, maybe they'll have this jacket. It's a handmade item. They didn't know when they were going to get another one. They may never get another one. But I had told this to Steve before, and then I shared it with Josh and Steve on the way down there. And we get to the store and the jacket's in the very back of the store. So I head back there and Josh and Steve go to look at the hats. And and I kind of felt like, oh, I guess I'm the only one that's interested in the jacket. There's this piece of attunement. And this is where I really struggled that depending on how your brain is wired, depending on how you were raised, we really can attune and listen for what do people like? What are their preferences? I don't know if I shared this recently, but my son's girlfriend had her car broken into and her jacket was stolen. And Daniel was saying it's the jacket she wore here and there. And I kind of searched my memory banks and it's like, oh, it's that grayish white fleece jacket that is this brand. And he's like, yeah, because I notice these things, I pay attention. And so the narrative that goes, goes on for me is, I'm not important, nobody cares. You know, when the kids come, it's like the boys all get together and what about mom? I really went into a place of feeling incredibly disempowered. And what I needed to do for the rest of that day and really through the next day was thinking about the conversation that you and I had, Jen, when we first met about if you're late, it means that you don't care about me and it just means that you and I have different time frames and you care and I matter. So I really did conscious work about, I can be feeling this way, they can love me, I do matter, I'm important. I used EFT tapping. I reminded myself that they do anything for me and I just need to ask. But I did have those gremlins of, I'm never gonna be satisfied, I don't wanna ruin it for anybody. It was very, very, very challenging. And (laughs) You know, I don't know if you can remember being a kid and like being out with your parents and feeling tired and not feeling like your needs were getting met and just feeling like grumble, grumble, grumble. And I just tried to hold it together while we were out shopping and not be unpleasant. But internally, I was really, it took so much energy to manage my internal state of distress so that I wasn't unpleasant with anybody and I didn't trust that I could talk about what was going on for me. I kind of want to pause. I feel like I'm doing a lot of talking. Do you want to say anything, Jen? (laughs) I'm just shaking my head here because I can relate to this, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I love, love, love the way you're articulating kind of the separation between the emotions that you were having, the story that you could tell to explain the emotion, right? And yet grounding yourself in what you know to be true, 
about your life and your relationships. And I love that these things can almost be happening simultaneously, right? Like you can, I do think it's important not to stuff our emotions, right? And on one level, I'll speak for me, right? This is how I would do it. It's, I would need to put my arms around that part of me that just wants to howl Mm -hmm. about this very relatable, very universal feeling of, it's got a lot of different nuances. So I'm not speaking, I'm not, I don't mean this to be for you necessarily, but it's kind of on that theme of, do I matter? Am I chosen? Like, when's it my turn? Mm -hmm. When do I get to whatever it is, feel my feelings, get recognized, have someone see me. Yeah, I boil this down to like an existential kind of crisis. Am I actually here? Am I invisible? Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, like what? (laughs) And that needs expression that has to flow. And how do we not have that throw just a bomb on our relationships too, right? Where, so, so to treat them to treat them separately in some ways and be able to speak for it and not from it, mm-hmm. right? That's IFS stuff. And I just love the way you're articulating that today. And when you and I spoke about it, that you just had such an awareness about what you were going through. And it's a real Thanks. gift of yours to be able to share it. Thanks. I really struggle because when my feelings feel big, I don't trust that I can share and, you know, not come from that place of woundedness. And it's hard. And me not saying anything took a toll on me and I don't know that I could have done it differently. And when you were talking about like the visualization that I have is a young part of me standing with my arms up in the air is like a why, like, what about me? Hello, Mm -hmm. what about me? You know, Mm -hmm. do I matter? Hello, here I am. So that's what goes on for me. Me too. And I'd love to find someone out there that it doesn't go on for. Well, I think that this is just really common and, and what kept being one of the hardest parts of this was, is I honestly did not think that I had expectations that if I was very clear, I would have asked for it. Yeah. And I didn't know it. And it happened twice in two days. And every time I realized that I had an expectation, it just felt like I got smacked upside the head and having to deal with that unexpected reaction and then having to manage the reaction was really hard. I have to say that there are times when I almost wish that I just would not be so conservative in holding my feelings in and just kind of let it all out and kind of get upset. Because if I look at the amount of energy that it took for me to contain and manage myself versus the amount of discomfort when I shared it with my husband finally and with Josh, I think that there's so much disproportion there because I feel like I'm so much and my feelings are so much in this situation that I think it was really a disservice to myself. And I don't know that I would do it differently if it happened again. I mean, this is where we talk about like we're having ruptures and repairs in relationships, mm-hmm. right? And that's the opportunity to see into what someone's going through and yeah. the willingness to be vulnerable, willingness to be messy and also continue to have your perspective, I think is what's so beautiful. I'm also really curious as you're talking and then I'm going to be quiet and let you continue your story. But this idea about, I didn't realize I had expectations, like, I'm so curious, like where the ex- sometimes the expectations come from. I know when we were talking about this, when it was happening and you even just said it, like, I know, like my son comes down when I need him, when something happened for days, like we're here for each other. And then I think there is something about this. I'm not, for whatever your thoughts and feelings are on Mother's Day or any other holiday, there's sort of like these manufactured holidays that yeah. I, th- I know sometimes they sneak up on me because I'm like, You live your life and you're like, I know myself in this case, like as a mother or like whatever and what my relationships are like and and I feel confident and secure. And then sometimes these expectations, I don't think they always come from inside of us. I experienced this not too long ago with turning 50 and suddenly it was like, am I supposed to have a party? What does it mean if you don't have a party? (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, Mm -hmm. and whereas like I'm perfectly happy. Thank you very much until some expectation comes from some other place that's not necessarily me. It's not necessarily internal. Mm-hmm. So kind of knowing what is what is setting us up. I think our yeah. culture, they abound. Like we can walk yeah. into some, wait, was, it, was I supposed to want this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know for me that it was not okay to have outbursts as a kid. And we've talked about this with the kids that 
Steve tends to be, he's not abusive by any means, but he tends to, you know, he'll get angry and then he is over it. And because it's so rare that I lose my cool that when Steve does it, the kids are just like, eh, that's just dad. But the few times that I have lost it, it really gets their attention. And there's this part of me that just really can be over controlling with having big feelings sometimes. Yeah. But it was interesting that what I noticed on Mother's Day and the day after I was on social media a lot, and there are some really large groups that I'm a part of, and other people were talking about the same sentiment of not getting calls, not being recognized, things like this. <laughs> and of course, in this place, where I'm already feeling wounded and sensitive and you know, wanting input, but then seeing these things that were hurtful, I found two types of responses that were predominantly common. One of them was, you should just be grateful. Like, look at what you have and be grateful. And the other one was one-upping. Well, you didn't lose this person, at least you have or negating. And I, I, I was just astounded at the lack of compassion and the lack. I mean, these are groups that have thousands and thousands of people and somebody posts and a thousand people respond. So we're not talking about 12 responses and the amount of people that were unable to hold space and compassion for someone who expressed that they were feeling hurt and that they didn't matter. It was hurtful and it was triggering for me because I was in the same place and I'd look at the comments and see these just lack of compassionate responses. Yeah, that inability to be emotionally available, really. Yeah. Right? And the message is you shouldn't be feeling this, you should be grateful and you don't have as, ba as bad as I do, so stop it. Mm. I mean, how many of us have gotten those type of messages our entire lives? It just, it felt like it was more wounding. Yeah, for sure. Tuesday, I was texting with another friend and we were talking about our experiences and she had something very similar and what we came up with was if you replace the D with the F and it was like Duck Hallmark and Duck Mother's Day. And that we talked about having a Mother's Day parade where we wear pajamas and no bras and we walk down the street and we yell and we throw things. <laughs> <laughs> now that is my kind of parade. Yes. I've shared this with a couple of friends and everybody seems to be on board. That I think that there's just so much that gets steeped in these expectations of what it's supposed to look like and what families, I mean, it just, ugh. Yeah, it's just a giant, like, perfectionism yeah. masquerade, you know? <laughs> it's very... And the pressure. The pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Well, yeah. I mean, let's just say it just keeps us buying stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So Tuesday, I did end up speaking to Steve again. And I struggle because he often feels guilty. He goes into shame. He feels really badly because... This man loves me and would do anything for me. And we're wired very differently. And what we pay attention to is different. And when I get into these wounded states, I know that he loves me and I know that he cares, but it's so, that wounded part is just so present. It really makes it challenging. And so I did end up sharing about a couple specific things that happened, including when we went to Ocean Beach and I was looking for that jacket and talking about attunement and explaining what all my gremlins are but it was really hard. And I also gave him the example of he lived in Alaska and he had this mug that we got when we did a trip to Alaska and it broke. And I, on my own, went on social media and found two of his high school friends and sent a picture of the mug and said, hey, if the next time you're in town, if you can find something that's like this, I'm happy to pay you for it and got him a mug. And he was so touched and tearful when he got it. That's attunement. Not everybody is wired for attunement. And part of this conversation that Steve and I had, he's like, I'm, you know, I'm going to try and do better. I really want to do this. And I kept saying that I know that you want to, and I know that we're not wired the same, that I listen for things that people say that they want or they need. And that's when I feel connected to people, I really want to be a resource. And having that desire to have somebody attuned to me, and this is where it goes back a little bit to, I think, if we're women assigned female at birth, it, you know, if you're a guy who's listening or you don't fit that demographic, it's not my intention to be exclusive. I speak from a place of lived experience and this is what my lived experience is. And as I'm talking more about inclusivity with being neurodivergent, I recognize that I may be excluding people, but I can't speak for other groups of people. So I, I just want to say that disclaimer. But we tend to be the ones that know where the contacts are, who likes the crust cut off of their bread, where the doctor is, when the appointments are, who likes this, whose favorite restaurant, whose favorite food. 
all of those, they're little details, but that amount of mental load is huge. It's just huge. And when I'm in this place where I can't tell you what I want, it is so nice when somebody will step in. And I have to say that on Mother's Day, Steve said, I know this is your favorite restaurant. I'm going to go and get you what you want. Place your order and I'll go get it. And so he went out and got you know, my favorite meal. And then later on, Steve and Josh went and got food for the family for another meal so that my mom and Josh had what they want, which I think was a beautiful example. And Steve stepped up. He knows what my favorite restaurant is. And this is the first time that he said, let me go get you something from there. That felt beautiful. You know, sometimes we don't want to have to think about what we want. We just want somebody to do it for us, to show up for us. So we had a really good talk. And that same day, I had to drop the dog off at the groomer and Steve was golfing and I had clients. And so he said, I'll let you know when I'm done golfing because we didn't know when the dog would be ready. And I said, if I have clients, I can't really pick up and respond to you. And because of this conversation that he had, he goes, oh, I'll call the groomer when I'm done golfing. Don't worry about it. And how I tend to put myself in the middle of all communication, you know, call me and I'll let you know. And so I'm making two phone calls. What's the name of the groomer? Where's the groomer? What's, you know, what's the address? How often am I the keeper of information? And while Steve and I had this conversation, I said, you may feel the same way about me because there are certain things that he handles that, God, if anything happens to him, I'm just so screwed. (laughs) My kids are screwed. I'm screwed because there are a whole bunch of things that he manages that I don't even have to give a second thought about. So if Steve had a podcast and was wired the way I am, he could very likely be sitting here talking to his friend about how insensitive I am and how, you know, I don't even have a clue about all these things that he manages because I don't. He handles them and I have no clue how to access them, what he does, where they are. So I want to be very transparent about that. Mm. I love that. Yeah. I love your sense of fairness in that. And Aww. that's really, va- that's really valuable, right? To know that there's a side that, yeah, that we're all human. And then, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. I think that's awful that often, and I think it's called the double empathy bind. And if I'm incorrect, shoot me an email and let me know. But I think it's called the double empathy bind where we see it may be where it's like a catch 22. I could be wrong. But that thing of I see my side and I see the other person's side and that often makes it difficult for me to assert myself because I understand where somebody else is coming from, but it doesn't negate that what's true for me needs to be spoken. That's right. No, absolutely. It's funny how there's like, I feel like there's two ways you can go with that, right? You can either Mm -hmm. become kind of like shut down and well, I don't know, kind of throw your arms up or it can be like, oh yeah, all of us, it's my turn. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> and that, yeah. then when someone else is going through it, you're like, oh, yeah, you know, I have a version of this, too. And and right. there's either like allow then there can be an allowance or, or a spaciousness for that, hopefully. Right. Right. I also would ask Steve to talk to Josh because I, I really felt like you're the father. And this is important for you. to. I said, you know, because Steve is not my child and I love that he gets me flowers and I love being acknowledged. But it's my children. And I guess what I should say is that on Mother's Day, Daniel sent me this beautiful text. He said he wanted to talk to me. I was out with my mom. I said I would talk later. And then I told him I was kind of feeling funky and didn't really want to talk on the phone. He said, did I do something wrong? Are you mad at me? I'm like, no, of course not. (laughs) I mean, the both of these things can be happening in the same experience. But I really felt like it was Steve's responsibility to model to Josh how to step up on Mother's Day. So later that morning, Josh called me and he apologized. We had a really great conversation. And he said, I I don't know if this is too late or if you're feeling like like this is just not going to work, but we're going up to have a goodbye party for Josh because he's going to deploy to the Navy sometime between now and, I don't know, the end of the millennium. We don't know. Uh, (laughs) And we're helping Daniel move into the house that Josh and his girlfriend live in and Daniel's girlfriend lives there too. So we'll be going up in a few days. So Josh said, if you're okay with it, bring the book and I'm happy to write in it. Because I talked to the boys about my husband's birthday saying, boys, write something for your dad about him that you appreciate. You know, we parents love hearing what our kids appreciate about us. And so I felt like it's not about the gift. It's kind of a no brainer. Just tell me what you like about me. Mm. And I had also asked Josh before he left to just make the bed. He sleeps in the bed that's here in the office. And I came in and the bed wasn't made. (sighs) And when he was here, there was a wet towel on the bed, which is a pet peeve of mine. And so I hung it up and I said, hey, just letting you know, I hung up the towel because I was in the front room. But wet towels that aren't hung up really annoy me. He's like, "Okay, noted. 
So again, I had that thing of like, oh, I don't want to be picky. It's just a bed. I can make the bed. I said, you know, you didn't make the bed. He's like, I thought I did. <laughs> you pulled the covers up, but I had to get on the bed and it's against the wall and you got to make it. So he apologized for that. And I did share with him all of the gremlin-y things that came up and how much I know he cares about me and the struggle that I have about being assertive. It was just, it was really a beautiful conversation. And I said, you know, maybe that by the time I'm 75, I'll, I'll have gotten this down straight. And his response to me was, maybe by the time you're 75, you won't have to ask. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was such a beautiful way of being accountable and taking responsibility and this just very intimate conversation that we had. And I really see that I don't think that with my boys, I have really shared how much I internally struggle with things because it felt like I didn't want to burden them with it. But I think in some ways I've not been very helpful because I'm just, I kind of let them get away with stuff and have not asserted what I need because I feel like I'm just being too much, especially because Steve is happy to come and make the bed and clean up after the boys and change the sheets and do all these things where I can do it, but I feel like this isn't really the hotel and I want at least acknowledgement of when they come. So it, again, that pulls against, I sometimes feel very, very different than Steve and the boys. And Steve is just like, he, he, he's just a better mother than I am. <laughs> he really is. <laughs> What I want to say is after having these conversations with both Steve and Josh, I noticed my energy lifted. I've needed to do some videos. I recorded a solo episode yesterday. I've needed to make some updates to my website. And I have to really be in an okay place if I'm going to record or do videos. I cannot be in a funky place. And this is kind of what you'll get from me. And it's really not very entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe for me that a lot of my low energy, my feeling meh, my feeling bored, feeling disengaged is really about not expressing what my truth is. And that energy just kind of takes my life force away. So maybe it would have been better if I just would have lost my shirt when this happened and it would have been out and other people would have had to deal with it instead of me having to deal with all of this internalizing, which I think is very common depending on the type of neurodivergence you have if you are HSP or ADHD or you're autistic or you have issues with impulse control or depression or anxiety that often we manage it very well externally, but internally, I really suffered and struggled for a few days there. And maybe if I just would have had a meltdown, it would not have been internalized. But I share this process with you because I know that I'm not the only one. I'm not. No, absolutely. And so funny listening to you talk, like, I think striking that balance of being able to be open, be vulnerable, be authentic, and staying somehow empowered, right? So it, it's disempowering to keep it all in. Mm -hmm. And it is problematic to, especially, so I'm thinking about this on a couple, my, my brain's going like 15 different directions, but one is with like parenting, right? And how parents are told not to let their kids see them cry or be upset or and that should be a little more nuanced I think right because there's a person inhabiting the role of a parent and you know a lot of like one thread that's running through here is that you want to be known you want to be seen so you, you're not just the role of a mother right like there is a person inhabiting that role Patricia mm -hmm. right? and I know like in my role like my kids know me like they know Jen because I let a lot of that vulnerability and that authenticity out and that kind of knowing and being seen and uh, is, is really important to a lot of yeah. us. Let's just say that. Right. Yeah. And I, but the, the nuance here is like, how do we be authentic, be vulnerable, have those emotions in front of children without making them responsible, right? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily responsible to, be burdened because they caused it or or have to necessarily do something about it but it more like it's just it's information that they are then free to respond to mm -hmm. however they like you know or in whatever way is congruent with who they are because there's also a person inhabiting the role of child <laughs> right right i had a little flash as you were talking also about just wanting to be known wanting to be intimate and how this also shows up in dating 
relationships too. So to take a real like sharp turn here, you know, Mm -hmm. it's like I have to show up this way because this is what's acceptable. And then we all want this like close intimate relationship at the end, but we haven't taken any of the risks to share Mm -hmm. our likes, dislikes, how things land, having hard conversations, keep it all in. I think your point of how fatiguing it is Oh, I mean, it really is. It's like you're trying to keep all these beach balls down underwater all at the same time. You're longing for this connection and to be known. And yet the very thing that would make it be so that you could be known is staying hidden. Mm-hmm. I, it doesn't surprise me at all. And I want to really explore this in my life. What are the ways that if I jam up the works and I don't let the emotions flow and then I don't know how to responsibly communicate about them and, and it's like, I have this saying in in some of my therapy appointments that like, it's like cleaning up your own tomato jar that you just smashed on the floor. (laughs) And maybe, you know, if you want help, you can certainly ask for help, but that it's, it's yours. (laughs) Mm -hmm. How do we communicate these things? And then, you know, to sit there, not let it flow, not express it and be longing for something that we have the building blocks to have, but you can't. You can't carry that many. It's They're meant to be shared. Mm, yeah. It's hard. I think if you're someone who grew up not having it be okay to have needs, not having it be okay to have wants, that there's this constant pull. And there are times when I'm much more integrated and I'm very comfortable asking for what I want and need and being very assertive. And there are other times like this time when it feels like I'm too much, my needs are too much. I just, it really is a struggle. So, and I know that for many of my clients that I talk to, confrontation is uncomfortable and this fear of, I don't wanna upset anybody else. But when I think about the disproportionate amount of internal dysregulation and upset that I sat with for much longer than I should have, yeah, you know, maybe if I just would have had an outburst, but I also have this other voice, especially with this new awareness of being autistic, that sometimes things are very much about me and I don't think about other people and their needs. And that fear that that's just, I'm going to become dysregulated. It's going to be about me having tantrums all the time, which I think is probably pretty average when we hold our feelings back that any feelings feel like they're too much, which is just why we're talking about it. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, is it a progression too? like having your feelings and then the insight about how other people are doing comes like, like, I remember, you know, like I always say, like we're verbs, we're not nouns. And anytime you get a snapshot, like it's not the full story. Right. Somebody in my family constantly has lots of feelings, gets them out and feels better. And sometimes we're like, whoa, what just happened? <laughs> we still love this member a lot and this member has done it a lot and knows that they do it. We've talked about it. So what would it take for me to just trust in the moment that I can be upset and that everybody can manage it? I think my fear is that I'll become dysregulated and everybody will become dysregulated and then I'm going to feel lost, Mm. which I don't think would happen. Mm -hmm. But I Mm -hmm. think that's the fear that I have a security of knowing like what's going on, where can I get grounded so that we're not all pinballs that are bumping around. And I guess if we were, then at some point, those pinballs kind of go back into the place where you ping them out again. Yeah. Things settle. Right. And trusting. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Trusting that crescendo. I think that's a common fear, right? That we, a lot of us have that if the door, the floodgates open, it won't subside. The floods subside. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So my hope is that some of this is relatable. I can't see how it's not. Yeah. And it felt nice for me to feel like there was a positive outcome. (laughs) Give you some hope and sunshine at the end. And if there's (laughs) not, that's okay too. And it does feel nice to be able to see something full circle. And what I had to keep telling myself in the moment, because it felt like this was always going to be this way. I was going to be dysregulated and disappointed for the rest of my life. I really had to go like, this is a moment. This is an uncomfortable moment. This is not a moment I would choose, but this is my moment. And how can I be in this moment and trust that it's not going to last for forever? And then, you know, I'd get the next disappointment. I'd be like, oh, yeah, here it is again. <laughs> <laughs> Got to come out somehow. And, and right. just also trusting into that resiliency of those relationships. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Anything else before we wrap it up, Jen? I don't think so, my dear. Thanks for sharing it with me. 
Thanks for being here while I was going through it and after the fact. I appreciate you. I appreciate you too, my friend. All right. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Hey again. Did you relate? My guess is that you did, at least some part of it. Yeah. I think this is just so average and normal. And how do we normalize this? And how do we work with these things? And how do we find ways to communicate? One of the things that Steve and I did talk about and we haven't followed up is how can I communicate with him when I'm in this place of I'm having a hard time making decisions and taking action? And I'm just kind of like, I just don't know. Because this happened for me the weekend before and a very different flavor. I wasn't feeling disappointed, but we were going somewhere and we drove by the farmer's market. He's like, do you want to stop? It's like, I don't know. I don't know what I want. I don't know what I need, but I need something, but I don't know what it is. So we need to come up with a shorthand to communicate so that he has permission to just step up and, and make decisions or offer choices when I'm in that place. We're human. <laughs> I don't care who we are and how we're wired. Sometimes asking for what we want and need is difficult. Sometimes confrontation is difficult. Sometimes we're concerned about upsetting other people or feeling like we're going to be that person. I mean, all the things that I talked about, I think are very, very average and normal. And I am so clear about how energy gets stuck in our body. And I think it can create dis-ease. I'm not saying if you have some kind of illness that you've caused it, but I do, I do notice that when I'm not speaking my truth or energy is not moving through me, it shows up in my body somatically. And again, I want to be very clear that I am not blaming anybody. If you're having symptoms, I'm not saying you're causing them. I'm just speaking for myself that I was very surprised to see how my energy and productivity and creativity has really increased since I had these difficult conversations. If any of this resonates with you, if you're struggling, if you have a hard time with communication, knowing what you're wanting and needing, setting boundaries, asking for what you want, I think I said having difficult conversations or anything else, Jen and I would love to be here to support you. If you are interested in working with Jen, you can reach out to her at jen at heartfulnessconsulting.com. I love sending everybody to my website, unapologeticallysensitive.com. I'm in the process of changing things over. I do have a new video up on the homepage and over time I will be working to get it updated but I would love to support you in your neurodivergence. If you identify as an HSP, you've got ADHD, autism. Probably the best thing for me around autism is if you're late diagnosed, high masking, low support needs, because that's what my lived experience is. And that's probably the best way that I can support you. But if you struggle with things and you wanna thrive, if there's anything I can do to help you, please feel free to reach out to me. Remember, Sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's okay to not know what you want. It's okay to be afraid to take up space. It's okay to take up space. It's okay to ask for what you want. It's okay to have big feelings. It's okay to have meltdowns. It's okay to feel peaceful. You have a right to be here. You matter. You belong. And I'm very grateful for each and every one of you. Have a blessed day.